very much. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be able to speak here this afternoon. Um, I want to talk about climate change, glaciers, and, and people. And uh, part of the interest in people is I had an invitation about uh, two years ago to go to an international conference, a behavior analysts. These are people who study human beings and why we do what we do. Because it became clear to me some time ago that the evidence for climate change is so clear, and yet what we've been able to do or accomplish or diminish or the, uh, the changes that are taking place have been very limited. And I think the question is whether if we had a perfect climate record, what would we do as human beings? And so, so that's what I'm uh, hoping we'll be able to address. Can we bring up the first slide there? So I want to start, uh, uh, this is actually a view of Las Caran down in the tropical Andes of Peru. It's a, one of the highest tropical mountains on the planet. It's also one of our, our drill sites. And uh, for sure, um, in order to do what we do, it takes a team uh, for everything. And so we have a, uh, a, a team of people that work with us. We have graduate students and postdocs. And of course, you have to have funding from various sources to make this possible. So what I want to talk about is climate change and just kind of an introduction of what we know. And I want to talk about glaciers as uh, indicators of that change and some examples of how climate have impacted civilizations in the past. And then uh, evidence for acceleration in the rate at which we are losing ice uh, around the planet. And then some evidence uh, like from the Kelkaya ice cap that it hasn't been smaller for over 6,000 years than it is today. And then bring in the person, the pe people part of this. Uh, E.F. Skinner was one of the founding fathers of behavior analysts. And he started out in the 40s and 50s very optimistic that human beings would be able to come together and solve some of the big society issues. But by the time he was 80, he'd become very pessimistic about this. And there are a couple <coughs> reasons for this that actually relate to climate change issues. One is that we, as people, uh, the immediate consequences outweigh the delayed consequences. So when we talk about climate change, we often talk about our grandchildren or what's going to happen 100 years from now. And as people, we don't relate to that very well. And then the consequences for individuals outweigh the consequences for others. So if you're talking about something happening in Bangladesh, uh, that is not really relevant to us uh, as much as it would be happening to us. And then I'm going to give some evidence which I think may uh, uh, be pointing to the fact that climate change is in, in the here and now. And we, therefore, are equipped to deal with that type of change. Talk a little bit about our options, and then our greatest challenges in the 21st century with environmental issues. So, a little bit on the climate. We know that the climate of this planet has been changing through millions of years. We know a lot of the drivers. Changes in our sun, uh, the 11, 12 year solar cycle, there's a 90 year iceberg cycle. The energy output of the sun varies through time and does affect the temperatures on this planet. We have changes in volcanic activity. This is the eruption of Pinatubo in 1991. A lot of tephra and sulfates in the stratosphere. The troposphere down where we live will cool. And then we have the internal variability in the system. And these have been active through time. El Nino, monsoon changes. Uh, this is all part of the climate system of our planet. So these are natural, and on top of that, we have the non-natural, the human driven changes. One of which is the changes in greenhouse gases, and we can look at that, how that's changed through ice core records coming up to our actually measured records in one law. Uh, we have changes in aerosols and particles from burning of fossil fuels. We have changes in uh, uh, black carbon from biomass burning around the planet. And then uh, we have over 7 billion people and they need uh, food and places for livestock. And so as we clear the surface, we change the albedo of the planet. So there are a lot of different ways that humans are, are changing uh, the system. And we have very sophisticated models now that we can look at what would you expect if you look at temperatures from the North Pole and the South Pole that were driven only by greenhouse gases. That's the nice thing about models, is you can take the forcings out and, and look at 
what would happen to the system. So if you have only greenhouse gases, the troposphere down where we live, the warm, and the uh, uh, upper uh, stratosphere, uh, the layer above that, would actually cool. And then we can see with, we have volcanoes, uh, major eruptions, this uh, material goes into the stratosphere, absorbs radiation, the stratosphere warms, surface cools. And we know that, we can actually measure that after major eruptions like the Cuba. And then we can look at solar variation, the radiance. If the sun changes, then we expect the temperatures in both of these layers to change uniformly because the energy is coming outside of the system. So there are ways that we can look at that and then with the models you can put it all together and you would expect that uh, uh, in the 20th century that the stratosphere would be cooling and the troposphere would be warm. Well, we have temperature measurements where we can actually go out and see what's been happening. So this goes from about 1958 coming forward. This is the lower stratosphere. And you see the temperatures are cooling up there, except for when we have uh, major uh, volcanic eruptions, which are these dash lines here. So you have uh, Aegang, El Chichon, and Tubo. And you see when those occur, the stratosphere warms for a short period of time until that material falls out. But down in the troposphere, the mid and uh, the lower, and down at the surface, temperatures are warm. So we know it's not the sun that's driving this. Otherwise, these uh, layers would be one and the same. And we also monitor the output of the sun. Ever since we put up satellites, we've actually measured it. So here we are coming up to the present. And in this period of time, when we set the two global record temperatures, 2005 and 2010, you can see we're in a very low output of the sun. Right now, the output of the sun is increasing in this solar cycle, and uh, we would expect the uh, carbon forcing, and the greenhouse gas forcing, and solar forcing now to be insane for the next three or four years. So temperatures will be warmer under that scenario. If you go in the National Academy of Science, you'll see on the in the entryway there's this this profile, and this was produced by Charles Keeling. He started when he was very young, and he measured CO2 in the atmosphere at Mauna Loa up to till it passed away in 2005. And the CO2 has continuously increased. And no matter all the discussions we've had, intergovernmental panel on climate change, we have not changed the direction uh, uh, that we're headed in. We have on the Earth these recorders like ice and glaciers. And in the glaciers, there are bubbles. And those bubbles are trapped the atmosphere from the past. So we can actually go in, extract this, uh, the gas from those bubbles and measure CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide, and we can look at how that's varied through time. And the longest record to date comes from uh, East Antarctica. It goes back 800,000 years. And if you look at that record, you can see both methane in red, CO2 in blue, that there's an oscillation that occurs. This is a 100,000-year oscillation. This is orbital forcing. That drives us into ice ages and interglacials like we're in now. And when we are in an ice age condition, CO2 is 180, 200 parts per million of volume when this building was under an ice sheet. And in the warm periods, it gets up to about 300 parts per million of volume. Today, we're at 393 uh, in CO2 uh, parts per million and 1,810 parts per billion in methane. So there's really no analog in that 800,000 year history. So if we look at our future and where we're projected to be by 2100, then we're certainly way outside of the range of natural variability, at least for the past million years. And so that's the concern. And we talk more about CO2 because it stays in the atmosphere for so long. Methane is only up there for 11 or 12 years and comes back out of the system. CO2, once it's released, stays there for decades to millennia. In fact, this is one of the, our, our big problems, because if we stop producing CO2 today, uh, we, we can look at how it would uh, decay in the atmosphere. So if you go out 100 years, you'd still have 33% still forcing the climate. If you go out 1,000 years, you still have about 20% forcing the climate. And we're not going to stop producing CO2 today. So there's a, there's a long uh, uh, forcing pattern when it comes to CO2. This is the more recent record coming right up to the present, and you can see it continues to climb. 
unabated. And in fact, this year, up in Point Barrow, Alaska, in northern Canada, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, uh, CO2 levels passed the 400 parts per million of iron. We have a higher annual cycle as you go further north on this planet. And But the whole, you know, this is the mean level, as you see here, about 393, 394 parts per million of iron. Now, part of the, uh, the forcing on this, of course, is us. And we've, been, we've seen these uh, population curves. And uh, we're now at over 7 billion. And we're projecting to be over 9 billion by 2050. And uh, uh, what we don't often see is what it requires to support us. So if you look at how many fowl, this is chickens and ducks, there's 17 billion uh, that we require in 2012, 1.9 billion sheep and goats, 1.4 billion cattle, uh, 1 billion pigs and 400 million dogs, and 500 million cats. And if you, if you look at what the, the pre-exploitation numbers of American bison, for example, were, they were 60 to 80 million. You get an idea of the scale of this. But probably, you know, it's hard to relate to these figures, but uh, if you look at the population, this evening at supper, there will be 219,000 more people setting down to supper than there were last month. That means a city the size of Columbus is added every five days to the planet. So there's a demand that's built in uh, to the system. Uh, you've probably all seen these uh, views of the Earth at night, and you can see the cities and and the energy that we consume. And, uh, uh, about 65% of, of the world's electricity comes from fossil fuels. And I was at an energy conference at General Electric. And they were projecting out what would the world look like in 2030. It's not very far out. But uh, this is their view of what the world will look like. So the question is, where that energy is going to come from? What are the sources of, the, of that energy? And what's that going to do with the greenhouse gases uh, in, in our atmosphere? So these are, these are potentially huge changes. We're fortunate to live on a planet where we have lots of recorders of our past. And uh, they go from tree rings to corals to pollen to spillers <coughs> and caves to lakes and ocean cores. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, ice cores because that's, uh, uh, that's what we uh, look at. Some reason that has stopped advancing. Can you do that back there? So if uh, you look at glaciers, the, the, the huge amount of ice is in Antarctica and up in Greenland. And that long record that goes back over 800,000 years comes from Antarctica. But we now have uh, records in the tropics that go back over 25,000 years. Those are often very high resolution. You can actually see the annual layers here. Uh, these are wet seasons, dry seasons, and you can see if you go through that, you would have a history uh, of the past. And I took this back when I was a graduate student. Uh, this is the largest tropical ice cap on Earth, 1977. And this is what the same place looked like in 2002. And it kind of brings home the message that not only are you losing the ice, which is a very valuable water resource in these regions, but you're also losing the history of the past. And once the glaciers melt, uh, uh, that history is gone. Uh, we measure many things uh, in ice, and it's a very interdisciplinary activity. Uh, uh, these are some of the parameters that you can measure. You can look at the past temperatures through the ice filter of oxygen and hydrogen, atmospheric chemistry. Uh, you can look when lead was put into gasoline. We can see when the Clean Air Act was passed and lead was taken out. Uh, this is recorded in the annual layers of the snow on, the, on these glaciers. Uh, in the tropics, we can look at the vegetation, so the pollen uh, that's in the ice, uh, the volcanic history through the tephra and the sulfates, anthropogenic emissions, uh, the, the bubbles uh, in the ice, and we can even look at microorganisms and track in the ice through time. Anything that gets in the ice is, is preserved. We work in the polar regions, uh, in, uh, Greenland and Antarctica, but also in the high mountain ranges in between. And in order to do the analysis on the cores, you have to have state-of-the-art laboratories. Uh, this is the class 100 clean room where we do the chemistry and the dust measurements. We have mass spectrometers to measure isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen. We have a storage facility. We now have over 7,000 meters of cores stored at minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. 
It's the only 